All right, today I am excited to introduce the world's first Bitcoin wallet that also supports Taproot assets. What in the heck are Taproot assets? Why might they be important? And how can you start playing around with this? All that and more we are going to cover today. Let's jump in. All right, so disclaimer, the wallet that I am referring to is none other than the Jolts wallet. And for those who may not be familiar, Jolts Rewards is my company. I am a co-founder of, it's a Bitcoin rewards company. I'll get in a little bit more into why we decided to go and build a wallet that has these particular features. But I wanted to mention that for full transparency. But before we jump into the wallet, let's briefly talk about what our Taproot Assets, what for that matter is the Taproot Assets protocol. And in a nutshell, it is a protocol that was developed by Lightning Labs, who is behind LND, the most popularly used uh, implementation of the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And its purpose is to make Bitcoin and, and really the Lightning Network a multi-asset network. Now, I know some of you listening to that may say, okay, here we go and may react quite allergically to that phrase, you know, multi-asset network. But let's talk about why I personally think that matters. And I posted this thread on our Jolts Rewards uh, Twitter account, if you are curious to take a look. But one of the really big use cases that people are envisioning for this are things like stable coins, right? And so these graphs are pretty interesting. On the one hand, you have the dollar, the USD, declining to less than 60% of foreign exchange reserves which is pretty wild, right? I mean, that is a fairly rapid descent when you look at it, but when you look at the US dollar's role in settling global trade, it is still a much higher percentage. So said another way, the US dollar is still by far the most dominant currency for settling trade, period, full stop. And while those numbers will continue to decline and are, we're still a long ways out from hyper-Bitcoinization. When people are using Bitcoin not only as a store of value, but also as a dominant medium of exchange and settling trade as well. And so between now and then, there has to be some sort of bridge, right? You need to be able to still get people onto the life raft that is Bitcoin. And from my vantage point, there are a number of different ladders by which people come onto this life raft. One, of course, whether we like to admit it or not, is speculation, right? You come for number go up and you stay for freedom technology when you realize, oh, wow, Bitcoin is so much bigger than that. Be honest with yourself, right? I see it in my numbers on the channel, my new subscribers, my view counts, all of those perfectly track price despite the fact that I'm not covering trading signals or chart stuff, right? So that really does emphasize speculation as this kind of user acquisition loop for Bitcoin. Again, people coming in and then converting into really hardcore hodlers and people who see the deeper benefit uh, of Bitcoin for themselves and their families. But there are absolutely other ladders as well. Dare I say things like ordinals, right? You may say, well, you know, what does tr trading silly JPEGs on the blockchain have to do with freedom technology? And yet it is unambiguously the case that the total count of Bitcoin nodes, so people running Bitcoin software on their own machines, increased as a result of all the ordinal stuff. And again, we could get into pros and cons more broadly. And I know that's a pretty divisive topic in the community currently, but it is simply the case that you have a number of these ladders through which people are coming onto the network that is Bitcoin, a percentage of whom are th then go on to realize like, whoa, this is the most important thing in human history in you know maybe a thousand years. And so it is my personal belief that stablecoins is yet another one of these ladders. I think Peter McCormick has done quite a number of really good documentaries uh, spotlighting the plights of some of the different emerging markets or economies where their local fiat currencies are melting at a even more alarming rate than uh, you know the US dollar, the Canadian dollar, the euro, et cetera, right? All of these are melting ice cubes in your checking account. But places like Argentina, places like Turkey, places like Lebanon have seen way, way more, right? And in those geographies, make no mistake, 
Stable coins are a massive market, humongous market, right? A US denominated stable coin is such a big deal and in many ways is an existential necessity for a lot of people in these jurisdictions. And so what Taproot Assets would do is enable the ability to create stable coins and have them riding on Lightning Network Rails, which is pretty cool. We'll talk about that a little bit more. For us as Jolt's Rewards, right, we're a Bitcoin rewards company. You may say, well, what in the heck could we possibly want with Taproot Assets? Uh, our main offering is, of course, Bitcoin and Lightning Network Rewards. We have customers using us to reward their uh, their customers for making a purchase, making a referral, signing up for a newsletter. Uh, it could be rewarding internal sales team members for closing leads in Salesforce. There's all these different actions that could be rewarded with Bitcoin, and you could use Jolt's uh, capabilities to do that. But as we start to talk with more and more non-Bitcoin companies and bring the very first of those on as customers of ours, it's clear that just sort of foisting Bitcoin onto their entire user base is a challenge, right? It comes with a steep learning curve. There's reticence and hesitation on behalf of these businesses who may, by the way, be like, oh, like I get it. I get Bitcoin. Uh, I personally get it. I'm just worried about introducing this in a seamless fashion to all of our customers. And so the solution that we have come up in partnership with these customers is a fungible taproot asset that looks and feels very similar to a traditional loyalty point. It retains the branding of that business. This is really important. No brand wants to give up the branding tied to their loyalty point, whether it's, you know, points, miles, whatever it is, while also having that value be backed by sats, backed by actual Bitcoin. So the business can now sort of get the best of both worlds. They're no longer giving their customers this crummy, awful unit of loyalty value that is programmed to debase even faster than fiat currency, but they're able to have it in this familiar looking, more seamless vessel that they can introduce to people. And there are no doubt other use cases, but that just gives you a couple examples that I have personally thought through in some detail and or are actively making a reality, you know, in the real world to solve for some of these real problems. And to give you a real world example, right? Like um, this is not just something I'm making up. One of our customers is an upscale fitness center. It's a beautiful facility. It's a fixed membership gym. So the whole kind of value proposition is, you know, you can go and typically have you know, very few other people there. You have this beautiful space, you know, to work out in. It's a it's an upscale gym, right? And so what we are going to be doing with them is creating the Kilo, which is the name of the fitness center, token that users can receive every time they come and visit the gym. And he can programmatically track that. They use uh, an app where people can scan into the door and so every time they come visit the gym, they're going to accrue some Kilo token. He might build on that in the future, maybe for like hitting your PR or, I don't know, completing a class, right? Different actions that contribute to, one, their fitness goals of their customers, as well as stickiness and retention, you know, of those users for the business. And that token doesn't have tradable value in and of itself, but what can be done is it can be converted into Bitcoin. So he's going to play on the kind of like proof of work, right, sort of thing. And so pretty cool. We also have a meal delivery service that is thinking along the same lines. So like this is happening and we are pioneering this. It's really, really cool. But let's talk a little bit about how the Taproot Assets protocol actually works before we hop into the wallet. And so the core sort of data construct behind all of this is Taproot gives us the ability to create these sparse Merkle trees which allow us to embed arbitrary asset uh, metadata and then folding in some of the other pieces that the Taproot upgrade back in November 2021 gave us like Schnorr signatures, TapScript. We're able to do this in a pretty private and scalable manner. Thematically, Taproot Assets is much more similar to something like RGB in that a lot of this activity is happening off chain. And that is arguably a good thing when you look at something else like ordinals which can also create assets on Bitcoin. However, as we have seen, that is a very kind of chain inefficient way to do that because everything is being inscribed on the actual blockchain itself. Taproot Assets moves a lot of that off chain, 
which I think is a better way to do some of these use cases. And the other really cool concept behind the Taproot Assets protocol is that these assets can be deposited directly into Lightning Network channels. And then nodes can opt into providing atomic swap services, which would allow you to transfer these assets across the Lightning Network, the existing Lightning Network, and benefit from that existing network effect. If you're curious to learn in more detail how all of this works, I will link some material in the description down below for you to take a look at. But in essence, it's this sparse Merkle tree that is keeping track of that special metadata about the asset. And it's just a really clever tool for compacting that arbitrary data into a constant amount of space. So no matter how many times I transfer this asset or do something to it, we still only need that single root hash to represent all of that history. And so you have all this metadata living off chain, but then a hash of it will get published onto the Bitcoin blockchain itself. And so that's important because an asset's lineage and genesis can be transparently verified. And that off-chain data is either stored in a local repository if you're running you know, your own node that has TAPD, Taproot Asset Daemon on it, or into something called a universe, which is similar to a Git repository for those familiar with that concept. And so the real so what I think are the properties that fall out of this technical design. For one, it uses Bitcoin itself to prevent double spends, which is important. It also includes embedded consensus, which is key and also different from ordinals where this is a lot murkier. You've had some issues, for example, with like the SAT numbering that is so crucial to uh, the meta protocol that is ordinals. You have the sum property of Merkle sum sparse Merkle trees that prevent asset inflation. It has low verification costs, right? Because it doesn't require the full knowledge of the blockchain. And as we discussed earlier, it's very block space efficient. So it is my personal belief that while Taproot Assets was a much kind of lower time preference, slower, more methodical development effort versus something like ordinals, which came out of the gate first, I think Taproot Assets offers just better trade-offs to do some of these use cases, particularly when it comes to anything fungible like stable coins, like those Bitcoin-backed loyalty points I was talking about earlier, and others. In fact, even BRC20s, which is one of the fungible token standards on ordinals, even their own documentation page states that, hey, like, this is an experiment. Like, don't put any money into this. Uh, and oh, by the way, if you want to do this for real, Check out Taproot Assets, uh, which was formerly called at Taro, for those of you that remember the initial announcement. All right, so enough of that preamble. Let's jump into the tutorial. I will say this is early. You have this little beta warning. So you can go to wallet.jolts.app in a web browser. So this is a browser-based wallet. Our team had to work some real wizardry to get all of this in the browser. So the goal there is that it's easily accessible. And currently this supports on-chain Bitcoin as well as Taproot assets with support for Lightning coming very soon. Once we have something called Taproot asset channels, which is the thing that enables us to move these Taproot assets across Lightning network rails. And so this will be a non-custodial wallet that supports all of those things on chain lightning and taproot assets but it is early we have basically just launched this but i wanted to cover this because i think you're going to see a lot more on taproot assets in the very near future and this has been a long time coming right in october of 2023 we had the first mainnet release of taproot assets however up until now it really hasn't been usable for the sort of average user with you know a nice kind of gui interface and so my hope is that the Jolts wallet can provide just that. So we'll go ahead and accept the beta warning, accept and continue. Um, and as we can see, this for now is pretty simple. There is send and receive. And then there is also this mint feature for creating the Taproot assets themselves. And so to start things off, let's go ahead and receive some Bitcoin. That would be sort of step one. And I'll talk about backups and all that good stuff a little bit later. But let's go ahead and receive some Bitcoin. So I've got my handy uh, Bitcoin address here and I'll just copy this guy. 
And so I am going to take this uh, Bitcoin address. I'm going to come over. In my case, I've just got my uh, Umbral node open. Just any right, any Bitcoin wallet that supports sending to Taproot addresses. And I will go ahead and withdraw some Bitcoin. Let's call it 50,000 sats for purposes of the demo here. Uh, we'll send it to the address as per this. And we do want this, unfortunately, a little bit faster. So fees, as we can see, are pretty elevated, but that's okay. I'm gonna review the withdrawal and we'll go ahead and confirm this. And so let's give this a moment to confirm. Again, all of this is still happening on chain until we have support for Lightning, which will be coming soon. And keep in mind, this is a non-custodial wallet and Lightning non-custodially is very tricky. So we have some very, very cool and unique using Taproot assets tricks up our sleeve. Uh, so you are not gonna wanna miss that. So be sure you are subscribed because I'll definitely do a video in the future where we circle back to the Jolts wallet and cover some of the uh, Lightning functionality. But let's give this a moment to confirm and we will be right back. Okay, excellent. And so we can see we've got our 50,000 sats here. I can come back to the homepage and I can see my history there. Uh, I can always check out the transaction information on uh, mempool.space if I would like. But now we've got some Bitcoin. If we want, we can go now and mint and create some Taproot assets. And so as you will see, this will sort of walk you through the process. You've got fungible taproot assets as well as non-fungible taproot assets or collectibles. And so let's keep with that example that I was discussing earlier about the Kilo Club Gym. Um, so we'll select the token option, we'll hit continue. Let's just give it a name. Let's call it Kilo Club Test Supply, right? You can choose the supply, maybe it's Maybe it's a billion, right? Whatever. Um, description, token earned for visiting the gym or completing other actions, whatever. Obviously this is not the, the, the real thing. And additionally, like how Kilo Club would actually do this in reality is through the Jolts dashboard where they would get the other tooling that would allow them to back this thing by Bitcoin. Uh, and other things to that effect. But again, just for demonstration purposes, I thought this was a good example. Uh, and then we can give it an image if we want. And so boom, we've got the Kilo Club token. So let's go ahead and hit continue. And so it is giving us the fee schedule. We can choose medium priority in this case. We'll go ahead and hit continue and we will see a recap. Do be advised there is a Jolts fee here, uh, but there we go. So we can go ahead and hit confirm and mint. And success, we've just minted a Taproot asset on Bitcoin. So we can go back home and we can see our Taproot asset now populated. Now it is still uh, minting. So we can come over to this transaction and see it in the mempool. So it is currently set to a priority where it should be included in this next block. But there you have it. So let's come back to the wallet. You can see that nice little animation that is pretty cool. And so there you go. Obviously you could do the same thing with collectibles, things like that. Uh, what should be coming either today or certainly this week is the ability to then transfer these Taproot assets themselves. So I could send some of the Kilo Club test token uh, to whomever by going to the send tab and you'll see you've got Bitcoin, you've got your tokens, your collectibles. And again, you will see that transfers are coming in this next release. So that'll be coming very, very soon. Um, and again, if you wanted to transfer Bitcoin out of this, you would do that from this send Bitcoin tab. Say that you wanted to send, you know, 40,000 sats out, whatever, you would paste in an address for where you'd want to send that, set your fee priority uh, and continue. So pretty simple and straightforward to send Bitcoin out. So we took a look at Bitcoin, at sending Bitcoin in, sending Bitcoin out, minting a taproot asset, which again, pretty simple. Again, some of you watching may say, oh, okay, you know, like I don't have a use case for this and that is totally fine. I would still invite you to stay tuned because again, the lightning support that we will be adding to make non-custodial lightning and support that through submarine swaps with some additional fancy tricks enabled by Taproot Assets, I personally think is gonna be a pretty big deal, uh, but time will tell. The last thing I wanted to mention is coming back to the backups topic. You're probably like, 
Ian, where the heck is my seed phrase and all of that. So as of now, the seed is stored directly in the browser's local storage. There have definitely been debates back and forth of, oh, you know, is that secure? Is it not secure? It's definitely secure provided you're not downloading malicious third-party scripts and running them on your computer and things like that. And again, it goes back to the caution earlier, right? Like a browser-based wallet is never going to be as secure as say an air-gapped hardware wallet. So keep that in mind uh, for sure. And what we will be rolling out right after the ability to transfer the Taproot assets is a export file. You'd be able to come up and generate an export file uh, that would be compatible with things like Electrum Wallet, uh, things like Sparrow Wallet, which also supports the Electrum standard. So you would then be able to restore that wallet elsewhere. That is how the backup would work initially. Um, and then the long-term plan is to use something called pass keys. They would be stored more securely for one. And that would also enable cross device sharing via something like iCloud or even QR codes. And so that's how you could get persistence. Let's say you wanted to restore your Jolt's wallet that you had initially created on your laptop to your mobile phone you'd be able to do that quite easily with the QR code. So again, a lot of that's coming soon. Final word of caution, clearing your browser history won't do anything, but if you were to clear everything, 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 including your local storage, and that would wipe your wallet and you would need to restore it. So again, don't do that until we have the export built in so that you could restore that if uh, needed. But again, I think you'd really, really have to try to do that. So I don't think that's a huge issue. But again, all of this is new. This is hot off the press. So do take some caution when you're playing around with this thing. But there you have it. Let's go ahead and wrap up today's video. All right. So today we talked a little bit about the motivation behind Taproots. I shared some of my personal thoughts around the use cases that I think have real actual value. We talked a little bit about how the Taproot Assets protocol works, how it compares to something like Ordinals. Again, I personally think it is not only a more robust, but also a far more efficient protocol to do some of these use cases. And then we took a little test drive through the Jolt's wallet, which is again, the first non-custodial Bitcoin wallet that you can get your hands on that supports Taproot assets. We took a look at minting a Taproot asset, sending and receiving Bitcoin. Again, all of that is on chain currently. I believe Lightning Labs has slated for the next, let's call it month or so. Again, don't quote me on that. Uh, to have Taproot asset channels, which point we can start then building the ability to transfer some of those assets over Lightning Network Rails, which again, I think is a big, big deal. I typically don't cover tools and wallets as early as in this case, the Jolt's wallet is, but based on what I'm hearing, you know, on the ground, very close to this stuff, I think we're going to see a lot more on Taproot assets in the very near future. I think this is going to be a big, big, big part of the Bitcoin story over the coming months and years. And so if nothing else, this just gave you a sneak peek into the future. But I'm curious to hear, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on Taproot assets or the Jolt's wallet? Are there actually compelling use cases here that can serve as these additional ladders for getting people onto the life raft that is Bitcoin? Or is this just some additional shit coinery that we should throw in the trash? Let me know your honest take in the comments down below. But I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this a like, use the share feature underneath this video that really does help get this to a broader audience. And if you were so enamored with this content, you wanna to donate to a plug, which really does help me continue to make content on the channel. You can do so in a number of ways. There's the YouTube super thanks feature built directly into YouTube. Or if you are so generous and you wanna send some sats, you can send it to my lightning address, ian at www.ianmajor.xyz. I do think that still is having some issues. So if you face anything there, you can send it to ragermajor at getalbi.com. By the way, if you happen to be watching this on your laptop or computer and you do have the Albi uh, browser extension, you can just click that bad boy while you're on my YouTube profile and it will automatically detect that you are there and you can send some sats that way, which is pretty cool. And lastly, for those that have asked, you can reach out to me on vita.page slash Ian Major if you wanna ask more in-depth questions, if you want one-on-one -on -one consulting, some additional hand-holding, 
I'm now working with a number of clients one-to-one -one on a wide range of topics from running your own node to accepting Bitcoin payments to uh, self-custody with hardware wallets, multi-sig, whatever the topic is, feel free to reach out to me there. We'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, every sack counts. And until next time, my friends, I'll see you then.